Okay, so that's two o'clock. It's time to start the seminar. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Rob Lambden. My topic for you today is talking about the seven warning signs of inadequate business software. So uh, these are general signs that applies equally to all kinds of software, whether it's uh, traditional on-premise software, uh, cloud software. We're going to talk about seven particular signs that people see. Um, we're going to try and give examples for those. Um, it would be great if any of you have a particular example to share with us. Um, we've got time for that. We're going to talk about five reasons why people end up with inadequate software and why they put up with it. I was saying to someone earlier, um, first of all I said, well it's not normal. And then I said, well actually, actually it probably is normal, but it shouldn't be normal if your software is adequate. So we're going to look at that. And then um, uh, we're going to look at the kind of things you can do in terms of trying to come up with a strategy for designing out these kind of uh, inadequacies in software. So we have got some resources for you to take away at the end. My colleague will be making sure we get a scan of your badges. I am struggling a little bit with this laptop working out how I can click all the right buttons. So. There we are, I have to do it that way around, that'll be fine. Okay, so, my opening statement, hang on, that didn't work, did it? Let's try again. My opening statement, making the wrong choice with software can cost you the business. Um, I've said this at a number of conferences and, and events that I've spoken at, and actually recently I said this and someone said, well, you really ought to talk more about making the right choice rather than telling people what happens when they make the wrong choice, which I guess was a fair observation for someone to make. Um, I was uh, only saying to someone today, earlier on our stand, they were talking about a new system and how a company that I'd worked with previously, really nice uh, company, guy had grown it from nothing, a national business doing uh, roller shutter repairs for retail. He had a fleet of vans out on the road making a a good margin, he chose to put in software that was supposed to be niche for the facilities management industry, which he considered himself part of, um, and he lost his business. Uh, the software didn't allow him to work the way he particularly worked. Okay, so let's press on. We're going to come through to the um, seven signs, and um, we're going to see, see what we make of those. So the first sign is, I've called it Excel to Excess. You've got Excel spreadsheets everywhere. Now don't get me wrong, Excel is a fantastic tool for working with data. Um, Excel will pick up live data from most business information systems. It will allow you to do things like pivot tables and reports. Um, and for a skilled user of Excel, they can get access to information really easily. But the key is, are you using Excel with your business information system, or are you using it instead of your business information system? If you end up using Excel to track, to hold the data rather than report on the data, that's an indication that your business systems are inadequate because they're not capturing the data that you'd like. So um, I've seen lots of people nodding on that one already. So there's loads of examples of this so for example um, you've got a company uh, they're using a, a, a system they sell from stock they've got a new product line and they need to track serial numbers of products that are sold there's no facility for them to do that in their current system that runs the stock so separately they have a spreadsheet they have each serial number that they put in as it's shipped to the client, they update the record to say when it was shipped to the client, and they've got a separate database of information running in Excel. That's a sign that actually they should have systems that can track that information for them. Use Excel for reporting on information that you've got, for doing calculations on the information that you've got, but not for tracking that information in the first place. Okay, sign number two. Um, sometimes people will recognise Excel is not doing what they want and they'll go ahead and develop some in-house systems. There's, 
nothing inherently wrong with that. I mentioned this chap earlier who lost his business because he had software that wasn't flexible enough to support his processes. And actually, it, it, there's a very good argument for having a system that is tailored to support what your business does. The problem is, is when you end up with a number of these being put together by people who've now left the company, nobody knows how it works, you can't maintain it, and it's a separate repository of information. And you're willing to find a way of, for the company, having a strategy of working out how are you going to capture all of that information and make it available to the people who need to have it. If you're in a company where your business is working with information systems or designing software, then actually creating your own systems might appear to be a good solution for you. Um, I say appear to be, I'm not saying it isn't, but I am questioning whether you need to create all of your systems from scratch when a lot of people have common needs and you can probably get a system that does most of what you want and then augment that if you need to. Okay, so how might that work? Um, uh, building on the example we had earlier about serial number tracking, um, they may decide the spreadsheet for that kind of scenario is inadequate and therefore have an access database. They've got a proper stock record for that item and they can have transactions listed against the stock, so when it was booked in, when it was booked out, which customer has it, etc. But the problem with that approach, as I said, you've got separate systems that need to be maintained. Um, do you really want a separate bespoke system to do that? You may do. It may be a small, unimportant part of the business, and therefore that's considered appropriate. Or you may want something that can say, we want a proper strategy for doing it, uh, doing it across the business. So again, there's nothing wrong with it on its own. A lot of these signs, there's nothing wrong with it seeing a sign occasionally because it means people are adapting to their environment, which is a good thing. It's when you see that happening all over the place, you know, actually, uh, we've got a real problem here we need to address. Okay. Next one. Scarcity of information. I see a few of you nodding to that one already. So this is where information's available, but actually it's really hard to find it. So you think we really ought to know how profitable a particular product line is. Uh, maybe you're in a, uh, a business where they are uh, carrying out project work. So you've got costs for the project, you've got some fixed costs, you've got incidental costs, and you need to say, what is that project costing us? Have you got it easily available? Um, you may find uh, that, that in order to get the information, you have to get all the information out, put it all in Excel, run some uh, reports in Excel, and then add all the information together that you've got off all the reports to get the number. Um, well, the information is there. If it was properly recorded in the system, you ought to be able to get it out reasonably easily. So again, this is a sign um, that your systems are not adequate, that um, the whole point of having a system to handle your business information is that it then gives that information back to you. If you can't easily find that information, you need to think again uh, about where it's coming from. Okay, the distorted process. So this is where you're doing something within the business which doesn't really work with the software you're doing. So because it doesn't really work, you've adapted the process to put something in place that's going to run over the top of that to get it to work. So let's think of an example of that. Um, uh, we spoke to someone on our stand earlier, they run a uh, marine supplies business. So they've got a, basically a catalogue of products, mail order, web order, telephone order, that kind of thing. They might have a deal with, a, I don't know if they do, I'm just conjecturing, they might have a deal with a customer where they have a particular set of products that they use and they want to order them by their own part codes. So maybe that's because they are um, remanufacturing equipment, maybe it's because they are um, packaging that as components of something that they're selling on. For whatever reason, they've done a deal where their customer can say, I need order, I, I need uh, our product code XYZ and then they know XYZ is their own product. Now, 
if their systems don't support that, what you can find, I've seen this happen, what you can find people doing is they have somebody who has a spreadsheet again for the customer, they look up this customer, if they want X, Y, Z, it means they've ordered this. So they rekey the sales order using the right codes. They then produce all the delivery and invoicing documentation against their own um, internal addresses, whether it's email addresses or, or printouts. They then get them retyped by someone else manually to put the customer's product codes on. So when it goes back to the customer, it's got the right codes. Now that works, but that's a sign of the distorted process. Now if you've, if you've got one customer where you're making good margins and you haven't got a high volume of orders, you might say, we can live with that. The problem is, once you start doing that, it starts creeping up and building up, doesn't it? So if you see that happening, you need to ask the question, are the business systems inadequate? Because, as I was saying earlier, unfortunately that kind of thing is normal, but it shouldn't be normal. Okay, the absent process. Um, so basically, you need to do something in the business that there is no support for in the software. So according to the software, it's not happening. Now, there are lots of things that would particularly happen that don't go through the software and it's not an issue. But if you think about, for example, quality control systems, it's quite common that particular stock that comes through the system must go through quarantine uh, in terms of the stock. Once it's passed its acceptance tests, it's then released to main stock. For that to work, you need to use a stock control system that's going to tell you whether it's in quarantine stock or non-quarantine stock. Now, if you have a system that can't tell you that, what do you do? You either book it in when it arrives, or you don't. And if you don't, it appears as though you don't have it. And then once it's tested, it gets booked in, and then you have it. And then you find you've ordered too much because somebody thought you didn't have it. They've redone the order, and they've ordered twice as much as you normally order because the first slot wasn't booked in because there's no process for handling it in the stocking system. So again, is it something you can live with? Yes but it is a sign that the business systems you're using are not going to be adequate for what you're doing. These are obviously particular examples that we're talking about. Okay, so the next one, delay in producing information. This is not quite the same as uh, scarcity of information, um, but in particular, it, if you want up-to-date information, which you probably do, which is why you've got a business information system that's supposed to give that to you. If you want a delay in producing, in, if you've got a delay, then how useful is that information? We've worked with accountants extensively over the years, and one of the things we've heard repeatedly from the clients of accountants is they say, our accountant is great at telling us things we already know that happened um, last month, last quarter, last year. What we really want to know is what's going to happen next month, next quarter, next year. Now, in fairness, that's not necessarily the accountant's job. But if you've got a system that gives you up-to-the-minute management information, you can make up-to-the-minute decisions. If you want forecasting, you can look for ways to correlate your forecast against your actuals that are reported in the system. That's only useful if your actuals are not only accurate and up-to-date, but they're timely. You're getting that information in time. So um, it's not uncommon. We meet people. They do produce management accounts for whatever reason. They can't produce their management accounts when they want to. Now, we all know you're going to have a delay because you've got to wait for late invoices and, and various things that means you probably don't cut off right at the end of the month. You may make, wait a week, you may wait two weeks, but we've met repeatedly people who are waiting months before they can get information out on what's happened. And if that's happening, chances are it's too late for the information by the time you get it. So that's not necessarily a system issue. That might be an issue with people using the system. They may be inadequately trained, they may not have the right experience, they may not understand how important it is to get that information out. They might think, oh, it's just a pain, 
I'm not going to bother doing it because it just takes me ages to run the reports. Okay, multiple keying. So this is where you've got the same transaction being processed multiple times. So it's not just somebody sitting at the keyboard and entering it again. Um, that's obviously the worst kind of multiple keying because it's taken up all of your time. Um, it's also where you've got a whole set of transactions happening in one system that have to be downloaded and collated, um, checked they're in the right format, and then re-imported into another system. Now, data exchange between systems um, is going to have to happen because often you want a specialist system for a particular area of the business. That's often the case. But what you need to do is try and make sure that the exchange of data between those is kind of, if you like, designed in to the way those systems work so that you're not running the risk. Every time you get multiple keying, whether it's manual or whether it's an automatic import, you've got a risk of error. You know, you haven't, you've missed off some of the transactions in one of the systems, they're not in the other one. Uh, you've got some of the recoding has gone wrong. Uh, the field length was too long, so it just decided not to import it, and nobody realised it wasn't there. So these are all signs that um, uh, things are inadequate. Now, I've seen a lot of people nodding to things that I've been saying. So I think, I think you all know that this kind of thing is a lot more common than it should be. Okay, so why is that? Why is it that people end up putting up with things that are inadequate and why are they resistant to change? So the first thing I'm going to say is that in general I have found that people really love changes that they make. But if somebody else makes the change they really don't like it. Okay, so that's my first general observation about human nature. If you want to make a change you've got to get buy-in from people to do it. If you don't get buy-in, you're going to really struggle to make any change. So if you're looking at how do we deal with inadequate software, you've got to work out how do you actually get that buy-in. Do you remember those adverts Microsoft did? Windows 7 was my idea. You know, quite a nice little undercurrent there. They're basically saying, look, we're giving you what you want. You're in control of our software. These are your ideas. And, and actually, that's a way of getting people to buy into change. Of course, they haven't found anybody who'll own up to Windows 8 being their idea, so they kind of they can that as an option. Okay, so let's look at some of the reasons. What have we got? First of all, insufficient budget. Now, it may be the case that people know that there's a problem but the perceived cost of change, they've said, is too high, there's no budget. That's a reasonable response if it's been thought through. These days, uh, with the proliferation of things like cloud, where typically you've got a rental adoption, um, that's not, of course, the only cost to putting something in, but that can make budget considerations easier. But, of course, you should only do that if that particular cloud solution is going to be a better fit, not just because it's cloud and just because it's affordable. Making the wrong choice with software, no matter what the price, will always be more expensive than making the right choice. Okay? So budget is going to be an issue. So if that is identified as a problem, you then need to get whoever is saying that to identify how that's going to be fixed. If you need to fix it, and you know you haven't got the budget, then you need to make the budget. How are you going to make the budget? Otherwise, you can't fix the problem. And realistically, if the cost of fixing it is more than the cost of the problem, you're not going to fix it, okay? Because you've identified that it's actually cheaper to use inadequate software than to get proper software. That's a good result, because it shows you've thought about it and planned it. I have never known that to be the case in my career, that people say it's cheaper to stay with a software that doesn't work. Okay? I'm not saying that can't happen, but I would challenge it if you get people saying that. Okay, insufficient resource. If people say that, I think this is a really good sign. 
because actually it, it means they're thinking about what it means to change. They're taking it seriously and they recognise that to implement a change takes effort. Okay, It's not just money. You've got to get people to buy in. You potentially have got to get people retrained. You've got to get people's mindset to change. So instead of saying, we talked earlier about these stock codes, we're going to run a spreadsheet and put the proper stock codes in and then send the invoice to ourselves and retype the invoice and issue it out. Instead of people saying that, they've got to be trained to say, actually, no, we need to do this in the system. And that takes effort. Getting people to change takes effort. So if insufficient resources identified, that's a good sign. But again, it's a solvable problem. What resource do we need? How are we going to find that? When are we going to schedule the training? How are we going to adopt the system? Is it a phased approach? Is it an overnight approach? What, what's the best solution for us? Okay, insufficient commitment. No one will tell you this, but this is normally the real reason why nothing changes, because nobody can be bothered, frankly. <laughs> um, and, you know, if people aren't prepared to make the commitment to make the change, it's not going to change. Um, I, a number of you that I spoke to before the seminar, uh, we said, uh, you know, what are you hoping to get out of the day? A number of you said you're in businesses where things are, you know, legacy systems, things have got old. And actually, often people don't want to make the change. It depends on the nature of the organisation. Uh, some organisations, they just have built-in inertia anyway, so they're resistant to change. Um, other organisations, it might be a family-owned business. Uh, the owners are approaching retirement. Actually, they don't really want to drive the business. They're looking at the business as as funding cash for their retirement they're not that committed to making the changes they need to make whatever the reason if there isn't commitment there isn't going to be a change if you can see that a change is needed and you want to make a change you've got to create a way of creating commitment so that there can be a change okay vendor tie-in I really hate this one it happens a lot there are going to be vendors who make it very difficult for you to change their systems. Um, some of the cloud providers, for example, um, how easy is it for you to get your data out in a format where you can use it meaningfully elsewhere? Um, there have been all, I mean, if you, accounting web guys are here, if you read through the postings on accounting web, I'm sure you'll see lots of people talking about that kind of thing. Long-term contracts. I was speaking to somebody a while ago. Um, they had a niche software uh, product going into the finance industry in the city. They had particular terms in their contracts about giving notice. It was a five-year deal, which was reasonable at the time. It was a big investment. Lots of development had gone in. It was a five-year deal. If you weren't going to renew, you had to give 12 months notice that you weren't going to renew, which on a five-year deal isn't that unreasonable. But then they said, and you have to serve notice on a call today or it doesn't count. Well, they were, what's that all about? <laughs> um, so they had all these people thinking they'd serve notice, but the term said their notice was invalid. So just check the kind of tie-in that you've got with existing suppliers. My, I, my advice would be, if you have a supplier who's tying you into a relationship with them, that's almost certainly not a healthy relationship anyway. Um, so just think about, can you make changes? People should be doing business together because they choose to and they're getting good value from it, not because they're in a position where they're forced to. Okay, ignorance. This can happen. People aren't aware there's a different way of doing it. Um, as I said earlier, a lot of these signs, actually, they ought to be uncommon, but unfortunately they're not. You know, you can have someone who's 12 years into their career working in finance departments and everywhere they've gone, they've just gone XL to XS everywhere. Everything is run on Excel, so they think it's normal because that's how everybody's running. Ignorance is quite easy can be quite easy to overcome because 
once people see there's a better way, often they're then invigorated to make the change and you get that buy-in to change right from the outset. Okay, so we've got the seven signs. We've covered five reasons, typically, why that situation persists and it isn't dealt with. What are the possible outcomes of using inadequate software? Well, I've already talked with earlier about somebody who's gone bust. Um, if you haven't got access to the information that you need, it seems obvious to me that your ability to compete is reduced. If your ability to compete is reduced, it seems obvious to me that you would expect your profitability to be affected. Now, every situation is going to be different. So even if you're not going to go bust, you would expect that profitability is going to be affected if your business software is inadequate. You just expect that. The problem is if you've got inadequate software, you probably can't tell how much it's being affected because you probably can't easily get access to the kind of information that will tell you that. So what will you do about it? Okay? That's a hard question, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, there isn't a single answer. We're going to talk about a strategy that you can look to adopt with. There isn't a single answer. There will be lots of vendors of specific products that will try and tell you their product is the answer, and it might be part of the answer, but at the end of the day, within every business, you have to make sure you're getting the right solution for that business, not just necessarily taking on something from a vendor. Okay, so let's think about that. First of all, if the software that you had was flexible, so it could adapt to different things, was scalable, so you could, um, start with a small number of users and a small amount of data and it could grow to support a large number of users and a large amount of data and if it was extendable so that you can take core features and pay for core features and then when you need more features pay for those that would probably really help with this kind of a problem so typically what businesses find is they have usually one sometimes two core information systems that carry almost all of the um, information in the business. Um, for those information systems that you're going to need, you need to look for products that are going to grow with you, that, are, that you're not going to fall off the end of the product and then find you have to start creating spreadsheets, you need to develop an in-house system, you have got absent processes and so on. If you can get a system like that and start as small as you need to and then allow your business to evolve over time with the same software, you've got a much better chance of avoiding the kind of issues we've seen in terms of the inadequate software because you've got software that is suitable for you when you start but that you can grow into as you grow. Okay, so that's good to imagine that. Um, we've been looking around at product for a long time. So at Online50, uh, we were the first people in the UK to host a mainstream account software package with the idea being we'd help accountants and their clients to work together on that platform. I won't say any more about that, but do come and talk to us on the stand if that's of interest. Um, we've been looking out over the years for software for smaller businesses which tends to be where most of our end users are at so um, we have end users using the service we have customers who might be end users or who might be uh, accountants providing services to them and we've seen a lot of scenarios where they're getting software that has a lot of the issues that we've seen here they need spreadsheet tracking, they're writing access databases because they haven't got the right thing. And we've looked particularly at how do we get something that is going to work for smaller clients? Um, and there are lots of options out there. So we've had a, a shopping list. We're a hosted company. We have users all over the world. So we can see for lots of small businesses, 
Actually, international support is becoming increasingly important. It's becoming very easy to do business overseas, whether it's off the web or through agents in foreign, foreign countries. So we need great support for language, currency and legislative compliance. We're seeing lots of people having issues with things like that. Flexible dimensions of analysis. We talked about not having the right information for you. Okay, so typically when you're small, you need simple analysis. As you grow, you need more analysis. That just tends to be how it works. You're bigger, you've got more volume of transactions, higher value of turnover, and typically what you want is something that can give you analysis in more detail. And it's because you can't get it that you then start adopting all of these other things that we talked about. You'll have all the spreadsheets trying to give you that. Or you'll just say, well, we can't get the information anyway, and, and just give up. So you need something that can give you that. Um, stock control, and, and particularly these days, virtual stock. So whether you're drop shipping from your suppliers or you've got an outsourced warehouse that's handling all the stock, um, or it's digital content. You know, how, do, how does that work? You don't put digital content in stock, but you sell it. Um, so having a system that can cope with the needs of today's industry, um, a lot of the problems, that the examples that I gave were based around stock processes. We talked about quality control, we talked about serial number tracking. There's a whole range of things where people are not getting the support they need from their stock control systems. And ideally, a product that's going to give you more as you grow. So, we've spent quite a few years looking around at various options in the market. We have other requirements that are not software related. So for us, we're a hosting company, we want easy hosting. We want um, great contract terms. We supply monthly rental on software licensing. So we want stuff that we can get out at an affordable price. What we found, which may be a solution, depending on the nature of either your, your client's business or your own needs, um, is doing something with a product like SAP Business One. It, it fits all the requirements. We can get it at the right price. Um, we bundle it with something called Forms, uh, which is our own IP for extending business processes beyond the system. This seminar is not a sales pitch as such, but it's saying that if you look long enough for the right software, you can find it. We found uh, SAP Business One, and we were able to do a deal with SAP to get all of the commercial terms lining up with the software features. So uh, by choosing your core information systems, remember I said most companies will have one or perhaps two core information systems. If you're choosing core information systems that will give you the features that you need and allow you to scale, you can start implementing a strategy for your business information systems around those, which will say, we know that this product is a product that we can grow with, and other things that we need, we can pull into the product easily. Now, it's easier to say than to do. The reason for mentioning SAP Business One and our implementation with Ambition is to show that actually, although it is hard to do, it is possible to do it. Um, we've been looking for years for the right kind of products to do it, and we think with this product we found it. It's been around longer, we wish we'd found it years ago. Um, and in other industries, there are likely to be other products um, that you can use as well. I was hoping to keep this down to 20 minutes. Um, I'm at 34 minutes, so I apologise, but we're still under time. Um, we've got a couple of resources to take away. Um, we would like to scan your badges um, so that we can stay in contact, and there'll be a video recording so we can send you the link. If any portion of this is helpful, then you can uh, share that with your colleagues. Um, the two resources that we've got, we've got um, a summary of what I've said today in here, seven warning signs of inadequate software, you can take that away. Um, we've also got um, just a general overview about going to the cloud, some of the services that our business provides, some of the things to watch out for in terms of what other people uh, might tell you that sounds good, but actually when you scratch, it's like a, getting a lottery scratch card, you think you've won it and then you scratch the panel and you find there's nothing underneath. So um, 
people have found that very helpful. We're on stand A650, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Does anybody have any particular questions?